A while ago, I featured the Dubai lamp, and it caused a lot of controversy because uh, this is a lamp that was not available to the rest of us. It was only available to the people of Dubai due to a deal between Philips and the ruler of Dubai, who said he wanted the most reliable, longest lasting, most efficient lamp in the world. And they created him custom lamps in one, two and three watt ratings. This is a two watt rating. And for those of you who said, oh, we've had those uh, locally at the local supermarket for ages, this is the one you have. It's got four filaments. It's four watts. This one is actually brighter. It's got tw uh, 12 filaments. No, it's got eight filaments and is rated two watts. So basically four filaments per watt uh, versus one filament per watt in this. And it just means that underrunning the LEDs and the choice of phosphor makes this much more efficient than this. You have this one. Well, actually, no, you don't. You now have this new one by Philips, which is for the rest of us. Let me uh, read what's in the packaging first. Uh, 3000K colour temperature for this one. Interesting colour, I'll show you it. Uh, 4 watts is equivalent to 60 watts, 840 lumen, which makes it slightly more efficient than this one, uh, the original Dubai lamp. It has some notable things on the side. 60% less energy compared with standard Philips LED bulb, 50 years or 50,000 hours. That, if you calculate it, out works to roughly about three hours a day. If you want it in actual year 24 7 lifespan, it's 5.7 years. 50,000 hour, uh, 50,000 switch on off cycles, which uh, the circuitry is going to be pretty robust in these, I think. Uh, instant lighting, not dimmable, can be used in uh, enclosed fixtures, not suitable for use in the rain. And then I don't know what this symbol is. I do not know what this symbol down here is. Hold on, I'm going to zoom up on it and focus on that. And you can tell me what you think that is. I don't know. It looks like maybe an overhead light. Is it just mean it's not suitable for illumination of uh, walkways or something like that? I'm not really sure. It's a new symbol to me. Let me put this back down and uh, zoom out and then focus back on the subject in hand. Right, tell you what, let's open it up. Let's plug it in. So it is quite unusual. It's got longer filaments than the original Dubai lamp. Uh, this one is rated the 4 watts. Just double checking that, yes. And it has eight of these longer filaments. Um, and uh, let me plug this in. Let me show you it lit. That's the best bit, isn't it? So I'm going to plug in the... Hoppy meter here is going to bring it in and uh, show you the power rating. And you'll see it's quite an odd shade of white. This is like, this is compared to sort of daylight because that's the sort of type of lighting I use at my bench. The colour is a warm white, but it's almost like a shade of cream. And I've got a theory about this because they do specifically say uh, eye comfort. It's optimised for that. I'm just going to give this a swipe and see if it flickers. No flicker at all. Let me just uh, demonstrate that on screen. Well, actually, it does look like it's flickering, but that's probably the uh, rolling shutter effect. Uh, 4 watts, 3.84 to be precise. Um, power factor of 0.5, which is fairly typical for LED lamps. It's not so critical because they're not a super duper high load. Uh, so the colour I would say this is, is a, a soft white biasing very slightly towards the green area of the spectrum, which makes sense because the human eye has a peak sensitivity of round about 555 nanometers, which is a sort of um, apple green colour. And they might be aiming for that uh, just to improve the efficiency, but also to make it softer in the eye because that's where a lot of the visual data in the eye will be resolved. Right, tell you what, uh, we're here to take this apart. We do that a lot in this channel. Stuff gets taken apart. So uh, I'm going to try popping the little stud out the bottom here. I shall zoom in a bit for this. So you can watch the blood gushing from my hands when I have a terrible incident. That can happen. Blood has been shed in the channel. It occasionally happens. It's called workshops. So that's the little stud out the end. Am I going to be able to nibble into this? This is where people also suggest that I use a Dremel. The Dremel does work, but it makes a bit of a mess. I'm just going to nibble it away like this and see where we get. It might be a disaster. I did say I'd zoom in. I did not zoom in. There we go. I have fixed that. Now, for those of you who also brought up the subject of the Phoebus cartel, 
how there's a lamp in America in a fire station that has burned for ages and they could have made lamps that last forever. In reality, the 1000 hour thing for lamp life, the original tungsten lamp, so this has got a plastic shell in here that is making this quite hard to nibble into, but the Phoebus Cartel, the 1000 hour life is a compromise. You can make a tungsten lamp that uh, lasts much longer. The building site, the rough service lamps last a lot longer by underrunning the filament. So instead of being a nice, cold, crisp white light, it's a sort of deep golden light, but it puts out a lot of energy in the infrared area of the spectrum and not the visible layer of the spectrum. So you end up with a lamp that lasts for ages, but uh, exponentially longer, but the efficiency tails off dramatically. So if you consider that a uh, 100 watt lamp of the original tungsten ones, if you ran that 24-7, um, and you only needed, say, for instance, you only need about half that amount of light, but you use the the longer lasting, lower running lamp, that would cost you about 100 years, 100 pounds a year in electricity cost. This is this has got a little shell in, in it that uh, is different to the last one. Oh, I should mention this is made in China. Where else would you expect it to make? All, all stuff's made in China. For everybody who criticizes China, uh, your, your computer is made in China, most likely. Everything is made in China. Yeah, it's not an ideal situation, but uh, but it is what it is. Yeah, this is uh, quite uh, tricky. I'm going to persist, though. I'm going to keep peeling away at this. Oh, now we're getting into the, uh, the glue at the base of the lamp, the bit that holds it into the lamp cap. This is where it bursts forcibly in my hands. So, yeah, the Phoebus Cartel was a standardization apparently between the manufacturers i don't know did it really exist but um it was uh, it wasn't just to fix the life of lamps and make profit it was based on efficiency of the lamps that compromise between the light output versus um if this, this is more circuitry than i was expecting this looks like a, I can see an inductor in here is this a switching power supply in this one that's a change a little buck regulator, perhaps. Let us peel the last bit off and slip this off. Let's give this a squeeze and a big pair of pliers. Scrunchy, scrunchy. Squeeze the plastic. Lift it off. We have what looks like a little buck regulator. Right, tell you what. It's time for some reverse engineering. A little bit of filtering circuitry as well. Uh, one moment, please. It has been reverse engineered, but before I show you the schematic, here is a bizarre coincidence. I decided to power up the lamp just to measure the voltage across the filaments because I needed that for a specific reason in the schematic that took the longest time to reverse engineer just for this strange off data sheet oddity. But I connected the lamp to this capacitive dropper, which is based on a 680 nanofarad capacitor. Watch the power rating and the voltage across the LEDs, but the power factor and the current and everything. Let me just plug this in. So the lamp lights up. This is it with the capacitive uh, dropper. Um, 3.86 watts, which is the other one was 3.84. 29 milliamps, milliamps. The other one was 29 milliamps. And a power factor of 0.53, which is very similar. This thing has gone over range. Hello, let's uh, select. Hold on, I shall reset it and uh, select the voltage. And it's showing 200 volts. So each of these filaments, there's clusters of them uh, in parallel and then in series. So each of these filaments is dropping 100 volts, but there's two sets of three as far as I can see in series. And that means that, uh, that it's 200 volts across them. Okay, time for the drawings. And continue. So on one side of the circuit board, we've got an 18 millihenry uh, inductor, which is used to actually limit the current uh, through the LEDs. We've got the incoming supply comes via 2.2 ohm resistor as a fusible resistor. There's a 6 to 8 nanofarad 275 volt AC capacitor across the incoming supply and a metal oxide resistor on the other side. Then it goes through the bridge rectifier and it charges this uh, capacitor 3.3 microfarad, 400 volts, up to about 330 volts. This inductor and a resistor, 1 millihenry, 3 ohms, is actually in series on the DC side with that. That's the component side of the circuit board. Well, the, that's the through-hole component side. 
Here's the other side. So here's the incoming supply, uh, live and neutral. There's the capacitor pins. There's a metal oxide varistor, it appears to be, and then it goes to the bridge rectifier, comes out. There is a uh, track on the other side uh, going over to here where we've got the inductor in series of the positive going to the uh, capacitor and then uh, a metal oxide varistor across that. I shall just add one small, minor, pointless technicality to this. There. That's a minor pointless technicality has been added. The circuitry that's switching it is a, a PT4554 a buck regulator with a couple of our parallel sense resistors. And it's got the classic capacitor across the LEDs plus the diode and then uh, a couple of discharge, very high value discharge resistors. And then they're just basically going across the LEDs, which are here over to here. Uh, that's about all there is to say. It should be a simple circuit. It wasn't a simple circuit to reverse engineer. Just one little thing that went horribly wrong in the reverse engineering of this. Uh, I'll give you a look at the manufacturer's data sheet. Powtech, uh, PT4554C. I don't know what the last letter was because trying to scratch the lamp cement off, I rubbed across that. It looks like an O, but uh, it's the, that's not a valid component. It's either a C or D. I think it's a C. Uh, here's the circuitry. Very simple. Bridge rectifier, smoothing capacitor, the usual arrangement. But notice the HV line, which is powers this chip going straight up to the full supply rail. That's the bit that screwed me up. Here's the actual circuit diagram. The incoming supply goes via that 2.2 ohm resistor. There's a metal oxide varistor across it to clamp any spikes. And then there's a 68 nanofarad 205 volt AC capacitor. It goes through the bridge rectifier, comes out the other side. The positive gets filtered through a 1 millihenry choke with a 5.1k resistor across it. And it charges up this 3.3k, uh, 3.3 uh, microfarad 400 volt capacitor, which also has a metal oxide varistor across it just to protect against spikes and glitches. So this will, uh, in circuitry terms, be round about the zero volt reference and this will be about uh well what would that be let's go let's go for euro voltage 230 volt 230 volt times 1.41 will give us uh that's going to charge up to say 325 volts this is important to know because there's a weird deviation from the normal circuitry here is the little chip that's doing all the work um it basically turns on uh, in the sense that it pulls this uh, pin D for drain down to negative. Current flows through the LEDs from the positive through the inductor. And because it's, uh, got a, it's not got a magnetic field at that point in time, it pushes back with the back EMF and it limits the current flowing. Once it reaches a certain threshold, sensed by these two parallel resistors, 39 ohm and 12 ohm, which gives about 9 ohm equivalent, uh, it turns off. But because this was positive and this was negative, then it turns, this becomes negative, this comes positive, and it actually, as the magnetic field in that collapses, it goes through this freewheel diode so that both putting the magnetic field into it and when it collapses and it's turned off are both used to power the LEDs. There is a 220 nanofarad capacitor across the LEDs. That's about 200 volts across here and also these very high value 2.2 mega ohm resistors, two of them in series, uh, to make sure those LEDs go out quickly and don't fade away slowly, I presume. But here's the oddity. The data sheet shows the HV connection going up to the 325 volt rail and I... Honestly, I, I was like probing about and I was saying, oh, that'll be to the positive and I was probing to the positive, not getting anything. And it just nothing was making sense. I ended up removing the component, uh, which was quite tricky because it was well glued to the circuit board and discovered that it was actually connected to here instead. So that uh, isn't used. That line there isn't used. It's actually connecting to the bottom of this circuit. And I thought, can they do that? And I suppose ultimately... 325 volts minus the 200 volts across the LEDs means instead of this chip seeing 325 volts, it's now only seeing approximately 125 volts across it. They may have done that as a clever trick just to take strain off this chip. That's quite neat if that's what they intended to do. I don't think it's a mistake. I think they actually meant to do that. But it's not shown the data sheet. I wonder... 
I wonder how they made it, that decision to use it in a non-standard way like that. It'd be a bit worrying to actually use a component uh, in an off-label way, but uh, I guess they probably just decided, they probably scoped and everything and just decided, well, that's going to take a lot of strain off this chip. But there we go. That is it. That is the uh, Dubai lamp for the rest of us. It's the Philips, well, what do they call it? Uh, Philips White are ultra efficient light. Oh, this was expensive, by the way. This was about £10 plus VAT, so it came up to £12, this lamp, which is a lot more than a typical standard lamp. But uh, I suppose, ultimately, the place that this is going to win, the application it's going to win, is if you use it uh, either as a sort of... If it's you find it a nice colour for reading, but also locations where are it's quite hard to access lights, or you want a decent amount of light and it runs a lot of time. Say you had a corridor in the house that you had a couple of lights in it, that might make sense to put these in. I'm a bit surprised. I'm I'm slightly disappointed at the circuitry. I must admit, I was hoping it was going to be the Dubai-ish circuitry. I thought maybe even. In this day and age, they might possibly have gone for the linear regulator approach like many of the others do. Uh, but this one, it just strikes me as it's not got that extra double layer of redundancy the other one has. But having said that, hopefully it will be staying fairly cool. Um, but it is ultimately just a standard buck regulator like you might find possibly in this lamp. But it's quite interesting. Strange, creamy colour, but... Uh, there we have it. Uh, the 4 watts equals 60 watt, 840 lumen. Oh, colour rendering index, 80. So not great, but that's common with the LED lamps. The colour rendering index is how well it renders colours across the full spectrum. With uh, the LED lamps, you've got blue LEDs and stimulating phosphors to add the red and the green components. It's not a perfectly linear spectrum, so you don't get absolutely amazing colour rendition. It's just like the early fluorescent tubes as well. Uh, but that uh, is just one of these things. It's the compromise you make for the efficiency. But a very interesting lamp. It was certainly well worth uh, taking apart and exploring. And uh, the construction is very different. And uh, that little twist in the circuitry that took me by surprise was quite intriguing and took a bit of working out. But there we go. That is the Philips Ultra Efficient Lamp.